This is a Bud Light product? You think different than most people. Eight dudes shared a girl or something. Absolute bullshit. Who is sculpting Zane Jam? This guy's got a hundred grand, thinks he knows everything. I don't even have a conversation with those people. Welcome oh, to the really pod. Like, uh, you know, you know, like a few thousand. No, no. How much do you have? Oh, Zane, this is really hard. And I don't care about how much money people make. To the next best thing with his drugs. It was, I don't want to be Warren Buffett. Imagine watching the national championship and having no score. I wake up at 5 a.m., I cold shower, I write down my goals. <laughs> no, I do none of that bullshit. He was you talking know, about me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make him quit by the end of this. Welcome to the pod. We're sponsored by Modelo now? High yeah. noon or Modelo. Put that there. Both. Yeah. I think we're already rolling too, right? Yeah. All, all is rolling. Oh, is it? This is a Bud Light product? Are you not rolling? I don't trust that. Well, Dane, welcome to the pod. That joke. <laughs> welcome to the pod. Are we dude. actually live? No, we are live. We just roll. We don't have a name of this pod, but you're on Patrick Kenny's podcast. Real quick, uh, can you get me the raw footage for this too? Get some clips and shit. Cool. It'll be um, how long? Three, four months. Until we start recording. Oh. Okay. Oh. oh. Butler on their troll train. Every pod, there's a lot of trash. All right, Junior. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make him quit by the end of this. Yeah, you oh, are. You, dude, you could be a Steiny. But Steiny like, talks back. You don't really talk back. You got to have a backbone to do that. <laughs> you got to like start talking shit back. <laughs> oh, there we go. No. Talking you and, you, you, you and OBJ, you do, you do the same thing. Good shit. No one, no one got that well, shit. welcome to the pod. We're here in Arizona. I got, but off camera, we got several of the Better Earth crew with you today. Yep. You got a posse. Yep. Seems like a hell of a culture you guys are building. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, I think if, if you look Zane Jan up online, and I start a lot of my podcasts like this, I think there's plenty of your story. Yep. Um, give us the one minute. 10,000 foot overview, and I really want to start getting into how you've built teams and processes to build such a successful company so quickly today. But 10,000 foot overview, who you are, what you do, to introduce yourself. Yeah, so I appreciate you having me on the podcast. Uh, grew up in Massachusetts. I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts and uh, didn't come from much. So my mom and my dad both migrated here. Both of them didn't speak English. Uh, my dad was a taxi cab driver, and my mom used to work layaway in stores. So I don't know if you've ever been to Marshalls, but my mom used to work in the back uh, end of Marshalls where there was no people because she couldn't speak English. So at night, she would try to learn Eng English and take classes and stuff, and my dad would just drive all day. So my entire life growing up was seeing them both work a ton of hours, but not really produce a lot of income, right? My parents never in a year made more than 20, 25 grand combined. So we didn't have much, but I progressed through kind of life with the mentality of, I want to be successful. I want to make money. I want to get results, but I don't know how to do it. So I went through you know, kind of the different steps. First step was, oh, be successful at school and get good grades. Well, I sucked at school. I failed at all my grades and I didn't get any great results there. And I just play hooky. I'd leave. I didn't show up to classes. Just wasn't my thing. After I tried school, I went into the next best thing, which is drugs. It was like, <laughs> okay, drugs is a thing. It's a hustle. People want to do it. People are talking about it. It's a thing that the quote unquote cool kids are doing. So let me sell this. And I started making a little bit of money, getting into a hustle. And that was kind of high school. After that, I was like, I don't want to be known as a drug dealer. I don't want this to be my identity. Uh, there's a long story behind it, but one of the pivotal moments that happened for me was I was in school. I was dealing, uh, I think at the time it was a quarter pound of weed I had in my bag, and it was in a big uh, kind of uh, sealed case, so you couldn't smell it. So it was in my backpack, and uh, I was handing it, and I was selling it to another student. So as I was selling it, this was ninth grade, I think. As I was selling it, I grabbed the pack, and as I was handing it, we were literally in the bathroom, like, with, with two stalls there outside. We weren't even in behind locked doors or anything like that. We were just, like, out there because I had a confidence level. I had done this so many times that I was like, I'm not going to get caught. And in, one of the teachers walks in and literally witnesses me with the, a huge pack of a quarter pound of weed in my hand, handing it to another student. He looks at us, 
obviously at that time it's a very big deal it's like yeah. expulsion from school there's going to be charges and all of this stuff that i didn't want to happen nor could my parents really afford for that to happen right getting a lawyer going through that process trying to get me to another school my parents had too much stress to deal with so that happened and he looked at us and he just like gave us this like stare and then just turned around like nothing happened and walked outside never ever forget that moment and that was the moment where i was like okay almost lost it all here I'm not in a good position i want to move forward and i don't want to be known as this guy so uh sophomore year i got into selling uh vima energy drinks probably like a lot of people that are up and coming and you know want to find something they usually look for an mlm and that was the only mlm that i had heard of ever in my life and i thought it was the most genius concept i didn't know what a pyramid scheme was i didn't know what an mlm was i didn't know you know what recruiting and building teams was all i knew was there's a product and if i can bring people in i can have them sell that product and they can use the product i can make money off of it that was the business model that i understood so I started doing that. I met so many people around the country and the world. I made money doing it. It was a pretty good concept and setup. But again, when you're in high school and you're making two or three grand doing something in a month, that's like life changing for you, right? You feel like a multimillionaire, even though, again, looking back, it's such a little amount of money. At that time, you feel like it's the world and I'm not having to clock in. I'm not having to go to work. I'm not having to punch in hours. Um, so I did that when I was around 16 years old during kind of the height of all of this stuff happening and me transitioning from essentially being a drug dealer to being, you know, an, a, a energy drink salesman, um, my mom had a stroke and my mom had a blood clot in her head the size of an orange. It was a massive stroke. She literally fell to the ground one day. She was airlifted to a hospital in Boston. And next thing you know, for about two years, she went through a recovery process. And for almost a year, she was in a coma where there was no communication. I couldn't talk to her. She had a 5% survival rate. Uh, it was one of the hardest things that I ever dealt with in my life. Probably the first biggest punch of adversity. Um, and what was crazy about it was normally when people think of that situation, the first thing they think of is like, oh, my loved one, right? Like what's going to happen to my loved one? For me, it wasn't just that. I'm also thinking about income because my mom makes 40 to 50% of the income. And I know that we are literally check to check and we can't survive on this. So that put me into work mode of like, okay, I got to hold down the fort. I got to take care of my dad. I have to take care of uh, my mom and the bills and the household and everything going on because during the day, my dad spends time with my mom while she's in a coma and just making sure that every that she's getting all the proper treatment and she's getting everything that she, that, that, uh, she needs. So went through that process had to take my mom through that journey, had to, had to teach her English again, had to teach her how to drive again, had to teach her how to read again. So I went through that whole process of just learning how the mind works, learning how people work. Um, and that was a very pivotal moment for me because I had zero intention to go to college. I always hated traditional education, but that was my mom's biggest dream. So I was like, how cool would it be is when, when my mom recovers and gets back to reality to see that I'm going to college and I have a degree. So that's the only reason that I applied to school. Now I had close to about a 2.0 GPA, probably like 2.1, 2.2, usually always in that range. And I was only applying to schools with above 3.0 GPAs. And I was specifically looking for schools that I could hustle in, I could sell other things in. So I was looking for party schools. I wasn't necessarily looking for an IB League school because I knew I'm not going to get into that. So the reason I applied to schools that I knew like statistically, I didn't have a chance to get into based on my grades was I knew I had a story. So in my college essays, I literally wrote about drug dealing. I wrote about my past. I wrote about my upbringing and I wrote about my mom's situation. And I got into the University of Rhode Island, which at the time was like a three, four GPA requirement. Again, with like a two, one, two, 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 three, somewhere in that bottom range and like a horrible track record of everything on my reports, right? My attendance, never showed up to school, never got my work done, my participation, all of that was bad. So I got into the school. Um, I was there for a short time. I pretty much spent like a little over a year there and I went back to it, went back to selling drugs there, um, promoting local bars and different things that were going on there, like nightlife wise, and then doing some real estate on the side. And I just started hustling and making unbelievable money for college. Like at college, I was a rich kid. I wasn't known as someone that came from nothing. I was known as the rich kid because I was always the hustler. But at one point I woke up like doing drugs every day, partying every day, going out every day, never going to class. I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, 
this is not the identity I want. This is not who I want to be. And this is not what I want my legacy to be known as. So I literally looked at myself from that day on, I went sober. Um, I didn't drink after that point for about two and a half years. Uh, didn't touch any drugs, haven't touched anything since that point. And a big part of doing that was I knew I needed that for myself. I'm a very extreme individual and personality. And when I do something, I have to go all into it. So that was the first big move I made. Uh, at 18, I got introduced to solar by a friend, went to sell solar door to door, um, started, you know, going through the ins and the outs of learning door to door, learning solar, learning communication, learning sales. My first few months were challenging. But then I started making money and I'll never forget. I had my first $10,000 a month, $15,000 a month, $20,000 a month. And I'm like, holy crap, I can actually make money. And that skill set that I use to sell drugs, that skill set that I use to sell energy drinks and make thousands of dollars, now I can go and make a quarter million dollars in a year doing this thing. And that was like the first real entry to solar. That led me to basically move on to a company, uh, get promoted to chief revenue officer, build a decent, you know, a decent sized multi million dollar business, uh, and then eventually basically take the leap of faith and start what we have today as Better Earth. Um, so just to give your audience a quick background, for those of you that don't know me, uh, Better Earth is a residential solar company. Uh, we do full-scale vertical integration, uh, fully vertically integrated uh, uh, solar installations. We do it in California. We do it in Arizona. We do it in Florida, soon to open in Texas, and then the Northeast as well. Uh, we are one of the largest in the nation. We sit in the top 20 residential st installers in the U.S., and we've done that in under four years. Uh, today, we have over 600 W-2 employees, uh, thousands of salespeople that work with us, over 70 different companies that work through us, uh, and a very big, you know, I would say machine and organization that's moving forward. It's remarkable the, the timeline of not only your story, how fast you got into solar then saw success, but really how fast you were able to... Um, make a change when you walked into that classroom and, and got seen. Yeah. Um, it, it seems to me like you, you, you make decisions extremely quickly. Yeah. Um, is that a fair assessment when I'm listening to your story at first, like yeah, a, a very so quick and driven person? Billionaires. I, I like to study billionaires. A lot of people ask me saying, what are your favorite books? It's hard for me to come up with a lot of favorite books at this point. I've read a lot of different books and the ones that I love studying the most are the ones that are about billionaires. Now, why do I like studying billionaires? Billionaires have accomplished something that only a few thousand people across the world have ever been able to say that they've achieved or accomplished. And it's an extremely hard task. It takes a lot of mental fortitude and a lot of discipline to be able to accomplish that with a hint of luck. So I want to look at every single one of the actions of the day-to-day, -day, you know, of a billionaire and how they're able to accomplish something that's great. And it's not just the dollar figure, but a lot of times it's the massive legacy that they leave behind and the imprint that they have on the world. So I've been like absolutely obsessed with that. So one of the things I was looking at the other day um, was a guy, he's a real estate agent and he was talking about his different types of clients. When he first got into real estate, he was selling to clients that were buying half a million dollar homes, million dollar homes, two million dollar homes. Today, he personally doesn't even take a listing unless it's $25 million or over. And someone asked him, what's the biggest difference between your listings at one to two million and your listings at 25 million plus? So he described his story. He says, when I have a one to $2 million listing, I'm sitting down with the mortgage broker. I'm sitting down with the banker. I'm sitting down with the wealth manager. I'm sitting down with the family. We're going through spread, uh, spreadsheets. We have to have multiple meetings about it in order to close a deal. On the flip side, he explained a story about how he sold a home that was $150 million in Palm Beach. It was with a billionaire. The guy was looking for a house in New York. The real estate agent asks him, you sure about New York? What do you think about Florida? I think that would be really good for your tax situation. He goes, yeah, I'm open to it. The real estate agent takes a flight without him down there, FaceTimes him into a $150 million property, and the guy buys the house on the spot over FaceTime. The oh. lesson in that is that guy made a quick decision. They asked him again. They said, okay, what else did you learn about dealing with these billionaires? Obviously made a quick decision in buying a property. Maybe that's just a financial thing and maybe 150 million to him is nothing. Well, he said, no. When the one to $2 million person goes to dinner, they look at the menu and they ask, well, what type of chicken is this? What type of beef is this? Oh, what type of rice is this? 
When I go with the billionaire, within 30 seconds, they have the entire menu ordered or whatever they want ordered and they make a quick decision. So for me, I learned very early on being over analytical, putting too much analysis on things, you know, thinking of what if, what if this, what if that is never going to get you anywhere. I'm the type of guy, I'm going to take a hundred shots at the dartboard, but I'm going to make at least one of them. But I am not scared to keep taking those shots. I don't need to take one shot and have it hit on the bullseye. That's amazing. Um, now you're, you have 600 W2s. Correct. So 600 W2s. And I want, I want you to go back to the beginning of the company because I think even for me, I look at that and I'm like, man, that's, that's so big. That's so beyond what most people can even fathom. They want, they're an entrepreneur. They want to start a business. Yeah. So you at one point with your partners were like, I'm going to start better earth. Yep. Walk us through the thought process of, I think hiring is, is a massive thing I've been talking about lately too, just being able to find the right key individuals. So there's two parts to this question. Number one is, what is a key piece? What's your first key component where you're like, I'm going to start a company, this is the first hire I make. I want, I'm curious your answer to that. Yeah, so if you're starting a company, uh, there's one thing you have to look at, and it's very important when you're starting a company. What type of individual are you bringing on? You have a few types of individuals. You have your A players, you have your B players, your C players, and then Ds I don't even like to address. I don't even want to bring them to the table. Oftentimes when you're starting a company, right? Like if you look at my company, 600 employees, are there C players there? Are there D players there? Absolutely, right? Because at scale sometimes it's hard to see those things. It's hard to make decisions maybe as quickly. But the thing is, if I have even five or 10 D players, that's five or 10 people out of 600, right? That's, yeah. that's, that's 1%. But if I'm starting a business and I have five people and even one of those people is a C or a D player, that's 20% of my organization that is now impacted by a C or a D player. Yeah. The energy in that original room when you're in a startup, the, the, the group of people that you have is so important because the energy, the vibe, the tenacity, the, you know, every part of the makeup of, you know, the first 90 days to first year of a company requires obsession and people that are over optimistic and extremely positive. If you have people in the room that are like, oh, we're going to fail. Oh, this is going to be super hard. What are we going to do? You're never going to get anywhere because when you start a business, the odds are already up against you. Society says that in the first year, there's a 90% chance that you're probably going to fail. So the odds are already stacked up against you. The only thing you can do is be extremely positive, have, you know, an a, a extremely over optimistic mentality and have this mental fortitude to go through any of the pain that comes in front of you. And the mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs make is their first few hires are employees. For me in every business I've ever started, my first few hires are other entrepreneurs that I can partner with up long term that I know are going to help add value to my organization, but also help me move faster. I'm yeah. not looking for people that want something stable and fixed. I'm not looking for someone that wants to be told what to do. I need to be able to tell you, this is our goal. This is what we need to achieve. And I need you to be able to go and get it done on yourself without me micromanaging you. So I would say when you're starting a company, that first five people are the, like, they're the most crucial hires that you can have. Yeah. And you got to put all of your time and energy to making sure that those five, pe five people, they're aces and they're A players. You do not have time for the B, the Cs, the Ds, even for the first five. And if you start to notice someone that's off, they're not putting in the work, they're not putting in the grind, they don't have that same mentality, they're always being negative, you have to get rid of them as quickly as possible. Because again, Serve, like the odds are up against you. And when you're starting a business, one thing matters. That's not how your people feel. That's not even your culture at that point. It's survival. You have to survive. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't get through the first three, six months a year, there's going to be no business in the future. Yep. So survival has to be like the main focus. So the first five people are probably people that could own their own companies. They're creative, they're entrepreneurs, they're business-minded, vision-driven. I think one of the most interesting things that is never going to be able to be displayed to most people, but is displayed to me, is the congruency of vision when Team Better Earth walks in the room, not saying when you're here, when any of them are here. 
every it's a such a large company, but we've dealt with, and and this is on my public page. So some people don't even know what I'm talking about. Sulfinity so Power, a, a solar dealer, a residential dealer, has dealt with you guys. We've dealt with other installers. We won't name them, and. In certain circumstances, we dealt with other installers, and it seems like one guy's singing one tune, this guy's singing this tune, and this guy's singing a higher note. A better earth person walks in. Everybody is aligned in the same vision. They're, they're customer-driven. They're goal-oriented. They want, they're, they're obsessive over the long-term vision of this company. At 600 people, how are you all on the same page singing the same tune? It's, it cannot be easy. What do you if put you're in place not, to do it? Don't be here. Yeah. If you're not, we want to smack you out of here. Like, dude, I don't want to work with people that aren't on the same page. If you show up to work and you're like, oh, Zane, this is really hard. Oh, Zane, you know, I, 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 I want to take a break. I'm feeling burnt out. Just not the company for you. And we're going to be upfront with that day one. If burnout is even a word in your vocabulary, if taking you know the weekends off if not putting in 50 60 70 80 hours is in the vocabulary you're just not a good fit for our company and again a lot of people are going to question that they're going to say oh you're not thoughtful you're not caring no it's i actually care i probably care more than the people that take fridays off and take weekends off and put in 20 hour work weeks because i know that type of energy and mentality is important for the survival of the company. And if you don't give it your all, you're putting the other 600 people and their families at jeopardy. And that's what I care about. Because when you're building a business, especially when you have your executive team, you're captaining, you're captaining a ship and you're all sitting there at the helm. And that thing's like a Titanic at the beginning of a business. Really the first three, four or five years of a business, doesn't matter how big you are, that thing can be like the Titanic. Mm -hmm. So you gotta make the right decisions. And you can't let people not pull their weight on that ship. Everyone needs to be pulling their weight. So for me, I don't get tied down behind the politics of bureaucracy of, oh, we need to you know, take all these holidays off and we can't be pushing people and people are going to get burnt out. I just tell people straight up, if that's your type of mentality, you're just not going to work well with me. This yeah. isn't going to be the place for you. And when you start to attract those people, what you start to notice is you naturally push away the people that don't have the mentality and the people that do have that killer tenacious mentality to go after it and do whatever it takes. They start being attracted to your company. And those are the people you bring in. I always see CEOs and they're the most analytical fucks that I meet. Everything they do is spreadsheeted out and everything is planned and they know exactly what they're going to be doing nine months from now. I'm here to tell you that's bullshit. That's not what's going to make you a great entrepreneur. That might make you a great CEO of a Fortune 500 company. But that doesn't mean that that's going to make you a great entrepreneur and a great builder and a founder. A founder is an individual that's willing to do whatever it takes and break the boundaries and break the rules and push those bureaucratic kind of limits that are imposed on you by the corporate world away. That's what a founder is. So for me, just in, in building the culture, it's like you have to make sure your team's aligned. And my entire executive team, we're all aligned on that. We all put in 70, 80, 90 hour weeks. We all work until 1, 2, 3 a.m. every single day. And we're willing to do it. And because we do it, guess what? We attract those people. But you go to that founder that's like, oh, you know, super analytical, takes them six months to make a fucking decision. Well, that same person complains about their employees. Why are my employees not getting anything done? Why are my employees not taking any action? Well, dude, that's what you're doing. Yeah, you're not taking any action. If I want to see what a CEO is like, I don't even have to meet the person. Let me just go talk to their team. And most of the time, that their team is going to be a direct reflection of what they are. I love that. So you've built this company. Um, I, I really want to get into... Sulfinity as well mm -hmm. with with better earth but you've built this company to where it is thus far uh, i think what you've done and this could be this could be applicable to any business you you've isolated specific markets to sell in you've become very very good at selling in those markets you sell a lot of deals in those markets in fact you guys are installing and selling more deals in like four states than most companies do in 30 states correct Obviously, there's strategy behind that. So what goes behind the decision-making of opening new markets, going to new places? Because you're doing it 
slower than others, but better than others. No pun intended. Yeah, no, for sure. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, well, it depends what your definition of slow is. I don't want to be bad at things. I don't want to do things very, very, you know, in a very mediocre fashion uh, across a lot of different forums. I want to do a few things and I want to be the absolute best at it. I am someone, like I told you at the beginning, I am an extreme personality. When I do something, I need to be all in. I don't want to be in a fucking state and do 10 deals. That's embarrassing to me. Yeah. Like I legitimately think if you're a, if you're a company and you're like, yeah, I do five deals in this market and four deals in this market and I pop a deal every other month in this market. It's like, what are you doing? That's not commitment. That's not obsession. Imagine if you had a salesperson that walked up to you and is like, hey, well, Patrick, you know, I'm going to crush it for you for three months, but then I'm going to take three months off and go on vacation. On vacation. See, those people don't work well with me. I need 110% all in commitment. So when we build the business, it's the same exact strategy. If we're going to be in California, we're going to be the best company and the biggest company in California. If we're going to be in Arizona, we're going to be the biggest and the best in Arizona and so on and so. So our strategy has been, let's attack the biggest markets first. Let's take away the market share from the competitors that are lazy, overweight, and bloated, and let's become the best in that market. So we did that in California. Now we're doing that in AZ. We're doing that in Florida. And now we're opening up Texas and a bunch of other states. But again, when we enter that market, we don't just want to be another average company that sticks in. We want to dominate, be the best, and really disrupt that place. So that's how our expansion goes. Because again, as you said, I can name... 50 different companies off the top of my head that operate in more markets than we do, but do 30% of the volume. Mm -hmm. That's not the business that I want. Yeah. I want a business that wherever I am, I'm all in. And that's exactly the way that the team operates. And that's what our market expansion strategy is. That's phenomenal. And I think that aligns with my next question, which had to do with your second uh, piece, which I think is so crucial, which I love so much is Pangea. Yeah. Um, just give them a 30 second, what is Pangea? So people that don't sell solar understand. Yeah, so Pangea is a is a software that is a sales enablement tool. What it basically does is it allows a salesperson to go in, sell a customer, project manage their deal, just like any CRM, uh, be able to see you know all the revenue that they've booked, uh, all of the deals that they've set up, what stage their job is and at what pipeline, look at any notes or any tickets, ask questions live from project managers about where their deal is in the process, actually sign up the customer. So do the financing agreements and all the documents that you need signed in order for a customer to be approved for solar and then see that during and then see that job through uh, install and activation. So we've built a full end-to-end -end tool that a sales rep can use, and we're still like one years old, meaning we're still a baby at that tool, right? We're brand new at it. We're very good and better than most tools out there. I would say we're a top five tool already in the industry, but we're just getting started. The idea of Pangea right now is to be able to give Better Earth a full-scale solution for all of our salespeople and partners. But probably in the next six to seven months, you're going to see a B2B component there where we want to go to other installers and we want to say, let's help you get the benefits of economies of scale. Let's help you with your equipment pricing. Let's help you with your financing costs. Let's bring this, let's bring all of this in. Let's remove all the inefficiencies and the bloat of your operation and let's put it all on Pangea. Yeah. So the goal with Pangea is to enable sales across the country, make it extremely simple for the front end to use, which is the salespeople, and then the back end, which is the, uh, the installers. So I think that B2B component is where I got excited. Um, Solfinity, as you know, and some don't know, Solfinity has been building a multiple nationwide installer network with the uh, multiple different tools. People don't know the names of them, so it doesn't matter. But tool, tool A, tool B, tool C, it's a different experience every time in the home. Rep goes to this house. He's got a design on this tool. Rep goes to the second house. It's a different tool. One of the things I'm excited about working with you in Solfinity is this Pangea concept that was is, is literally a year old. Within a year, we'll be enabling us to not only have a rep go into the home and know every single time it's the same experience, no matter the installer, but the scalability of that. Let's, let's talk about that for a minute. The scalability of training every rep, singing the same tune, which is what we mentioned, on the same platform. And what do you think 
Like, what is your idea of projections of how that'll impact a Sulfinity that does, say, about 300 deals a month that probably organically can keep going the way we're going to five, 600 deals a month, but throwing Pangea in there, how will that impact our business um, from a growth perspective? Yeah, we have a very big problem in the industry. The problem is that the industry is extremely fragmented on the sales and the installation side, meaning there's tens of thousands of installers out there and tens of thousands of sales companies that are out there. And 99% of them have no business being in business. So what I'm a big believer in is that solar is going to continue to move forward. The growth is going to continue to, you know, grow at record rates over the next decade. I believe 50% of the country is going to be solar over the next decade. That's a massive amount of growth. We have 85 million single family detached homes in the United States right now. Uh, under 4 million of them have solar right now. So an extremely small percentage. And every year that 85 million becomes 86, 87, 88. Yep. And keep in mind, that's not including multifamily apartments, complexes. There's like 130 million of those. And that list keeps on growing. We're just talking about the single family detached homes. So the market share is so big, but you have so many people, like I said, not committed, not going all in and being able to provide the customer with the solution that makes sense. Why? Because again, I don't blame a customer. If I go and I want solar, I'm going to get a proposal from you. I'm going to get a proposal from you. And I'm going to get a proposal from you. And all three might have completely different numbers, different things going on, and different processes. And that's really confusing for a customer, especially with something like solar where they're not fully educated on it. It's not like real estate or a car. It hasn't been around for 100 years or 200 years where people have just been constantly buying it and they know exactly what the marketplace is like. It's a very immature industry. And we're going through the maturation process. And a big part of that is going to be bringing together installers. There's going to be a consolidation where it's going to go from tens of thousands of installers controlling the market to five installers controlling the market. And then I believe another maybe 10 to maybe 15 sales organizations that are going to control the market. And the goal with Pangea is to be a part of every one of those transactions. Yep from the sales to the install side. We're not greedy. We don't have to sell every deal. We don't have to install every deal, but we want to just be a part of the transaction. And that's exactly what Pangea does. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and I think that on your roadmap, you already had mentioned to me off camera that, that your, your plan is not only solar. It's the betterment of the home in general from an energy efficiency standpoint. So how does that how does that stack up in a roadmap while you're, and this is more of a, just a business question. Like you're growing this business. It's still growing. You guys are still young. You're still adding and acquiring talent. You're acquiring installers. You're going to new markets. And then you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to build a software. Oh yeah. And by the way, I also want to be, you know, better home and have energy efficiency stuff and windows and, and all the, it's like, is it just come down to the team that you're able to, you know, go through all of these things at once and still, keep it flowing in a, in a very direct manner. Yeah. The whole thing of, Oh, we have too much on our plate. That's absolute bullshit. Yeah. That doesn't exist. We don't have one plate at our company. Our company <laughs> isn't one plate. I got my plate. <laughs> I might have too much on my plate. Doesn't mean that you have too much on your plate. Doesn't mean that you have too much on your plate. Doesn't mean that Patrick here has too much on his plate. Everyone has a plate. So when you say we have too much on our plate, who has too much on their plate? Not Find the company. Plate. Find a new plate. <laughs> so what do we like to do? We have 600 mouths to feed. Let's fill up their fucking plates if they want to win, mm -hmm. right? So if we're launching a home division, I don't need to do that. I don't need to go and put in a smart home security system. I need to go in and put a Nest thermostat. I don't need to go and put in a solar monitoring system. That's not my job, but I do need the people. Yeah. And as long as you can have the vision and you have the clear roadmap of the direction that you're going in, people will start to come and fill up their plate. So what I like to do is instead of filling up everyone's plate with the same thing, you guys do this, you focus on this, you focus on this. The Pangea team barely works with the Better Earth team. Obviously, there's communication there, but their number one goal is to not build the best software for better earth. Their number one goal is to build the best tool for the industry. And no one can tell them any differently. Our sales forces, 
Their job is not to move as fast as our installation company. Their job is to build the best sales force in the nation for residential solar and other attachment products. Our installation crews, their job isn't just to meet up with the demand of sales or make sure that, you know, we're to talking to Pangea, their job is to create the best installations in the United States. So every time we're building a team and a business, we look at it just like that. It's not just another part of the company, it's its own business. Installation is a business, software is a business, finance is a business, sales is a business. And just like they're all businesses, every business has a CEO. And that CEO has a plate. Their title might not be CEO, but they operate with those functions. So if you wanna grow big and you wanna grow fast, you have to do that. And the mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs make is they are way too selfish and greedy. They wanna do it all of it by themselves. They wanna own 100% of it and they don't wanna give anything up. And what ends up happening is they never get anywhere. They're at a stalemate because they don't have support. Well, I can't go and have people build all these businesses and own 100% of it. I need to be flexible. I need to be someone that's generous. I need to be someone that's giving. Yep. Because I would rather 1% of a trillion dollar company than 100% of a $10 million company. And that's always been the mentality. So we're very giving here because we know what we're after isn't a two-year thing. It's not a five-year thing. It's a hundred-year plus plan. When I die, I want this thing to live on and I want this to become the standard of energy. And that's exactly what the focus is. So the team knows that that's the vision. Every time we talk to them, it's about the long-term plan. If your team is just focused on, oh, well, our job is we sell solar and this is what we do. Of course, your plate's going to be fucking full. That's all you can think with. But when you're thinking about what we're creating worldwide and the goal and how big it is, that little solar problem that you have, that becomes tiny in comparison to the real problem that you're trying to solve that is much bigger. Yeah. So I want to pivot the podcast because I think it's ultra clear where Better Earth is going, what you plan to do with it. The one of my questions is going to be, what do you plan to do with it? You just answered your own question in the, in the statement. Um, you want it to be around as a legacy company. When you're gone, it's going to be around forever. No, I want to, I want to sell it, cash out, <laughs> move to Ibiza, float, float, float on my yacht with a bunch of supermodels all day. Um, well, I did. So, so the pivot, the pivot was Zane. We're going to pivot to Zane. Um, because I think that now one of the one of the most interesting things I've been able to do on this show is I've interviewed people that trade stocks, network marketers, developers, a uh, guy that sold a lead management company. I mean, all sorts of things. And one of the questions I ask all of them is, you made the money. You're making the money. What are you doing with it? So that's where we're, I want to pivot now is I'm interested to know we were chatting, chatting at lunch about real estate. What are you doing with the money you're making in solar? Um, to, you know, compound it? What, what, what do you do to invest your money? Uh, it's a very repetitive topic in my podcast. Yeah, money in. has four, four segments, okay? I want you to call them buckets. Bucket one, two, three, and four. Bucket number one is your business. What is an investment that you can put into your business that's gonna give you a 90 to 180 day return? That is the number one thing that all of my money is going to go into before I worry about watches and real estate and cars and going out there and buying shit. My business. Why? Because my business is the only asset that I have where I put in a dollar and I can print a thousand dollars. I cannot do that with any cryptocurrency, any real estate investment, any stock market investment. Nothing is going to produce those types of returns. Number two is going to be back into my business, but it's going to be in long-term investments. Something that might take me one, two, three, four years to come to fruition, but I believe in it. Pangea is a great example. For the first year, Pangea has not produced me a single dollar. Our business doesn't rely on Pangea. Obviously, we use it and it's a tool that we have and it you know saves us money and prints us efficiency, but it's not a revenue grab. It's not yeah. a cash grab today. It's a long-term play because we know as a business, our entire team, we know that that is going to be a game-changing software for our industry. So that's a great example of a B2 investment, I call it, which is a longer term investment, but back in your business. And then you have B3. B3 is a really interesting one. That's where you can make personal investments on your own that help your business out. 
So let's just say, for example, you wanted to buy a warehouse. Well, you can go and you can buy that warehouse personally and you can lease that back to your company. So in the case, I, I would never do this, right? I'm never selling my company. But let's say you were to sell your company, but you owned all the real estate. It's the famous Ray Kroc McDonald's play. If I owned all my warehouses, well, I could sell my entire company, but still be getting those lease checks every single month because I personally own the real estate. That's the third most efficient bucket that you can go because it supports your business. Who's the best landlord yourself? Who's the best tenant yourself, right? But you're still making a traditional investment and making money. You're supporting your business and you're making money. Then you have your fourth bucket and that's everything else for me. I try to put minimal time into that. We do real estate flips, long-term real estate deals. I have money in the stock market. I have money in crypto. I own a bunch of watches, put money in cars, JV and deals, want to invest in this company, could do whatever I want with that portion of it. But if I'm being completely honest, less than 1% of my time goes into even thinking about that. Because what I'm building to me is a thousand X bigger than any investment is ever going to make me. I see this happen all the time. You have this kid, he shows up to me and he's like, Zane, what's the perfect investment? I'm like, how much money you got in your bank account? Uh, you know, like, like, like a lot, you know, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm making more. No. (laughs) How much money do you have in your account? Uh, you know, you know, like a few thousand, no, no. How much do you have? I have $1,834. Take that, the best thing that that kid could do is take $1,834 and throw it away somewhere. Invest in a course, invest in a skill set, invest in something that is going to make you more money. Because I hate to say it, $1,834, you're not going to make it. Tell me one major city across the US where that's even going to get you through two weeks. Mm. Just not. So what I always tell those people that come up to me and they, listen, all my DMs, all my messages are a lot of those people. And I get hate for it too. People are like, Zane, that's irresponsible advice. People could save up. Let me ask you a question. You got $1,000. What has the S&P 500 produced over the last decade? Eight. 8%. What's that $8,000 going to make you in the first year? Well, sorry, what's that 8% going to make you on $1,000? 80. 80 bucks. How much is 80 bucks a month? (laughs) Six, seven bucks? Going to buy six McDoubles? What are you going to do with it? So put it back into yourself. So for me, it's like I, as much as I, you know, I listen to Grant Cardone and, and Warren Buffett and, you know, all these guys that talk about preachment with investment. For me, I just, I, I can tell you my truth. Maybe for you, maybe for someone else, that route makes more sense. Yeah. But for me, I'm a passionate individual, as you can see, putting all my chips in to my baby might not financially be the smartest move, might not be diversifying my portfolio, but it's doing what I believe in. And betting on myself is the reason that I'm here. So I'm going to continue to keep doing what works. So what is so interesting to me is, is I've asked that question seven or eight times and Jason shot these videos. That is a drastically different answer than every single guest and some of these guests have, have been had phenomenal success every one of them is like oh I, I do real estate i do stocks and they're and you immediately were like stop just triple down on your business so that's so interesting so my follow-up question to that is who is sculpting zane jam is it yourself is there do you have a specific mentor books podcasts like you think clearly different than most people clearly you're passionate about what you're doing what happened? Where, where was the moment? Who were you listening to? Or Observation. It, I got it. I'm extremely curious. I don't just read to read, watch to watch. I observe. How do you move? What do you say? What are your words? How do you text? How do you email? If I'm talking to someone successful, I'm looking at every single thing that they do. Observation has been the reason that I'm here today. I did not find a magic trick from a book. I did not find a magic formula. I didn't have a magic investment. I always tell people, I am the last person to ever win the lottery. I am the last person to ever invest in a moonshot coin or a company. Just not who I am. That's not what I do. I'm never going to put my odds into someone else. Mm. I can only bet on myself. So my number one ROI skill set has been observing people and being curious about other people and going all in on just mimicking them. Like, what do they do? How do they act? How do they treat their team? How do they build their company? How do they eat dinner? How do they order? How do they, you know, deal with their relationships? 
I want to find the best in every category and I want to copy them completely and absolutely mimic them. And when I look at the most successful people in the world, Jeff Bezos didn't save his way to becoming one of the richest men in the world. Elon Musk didn't invest his way to becoming one of the richest men in the world. What do both of those individuals have in common? They went all into their business. When was the last time you heard Elon talking about, oh, you know, I'm thinking about buying this stock and thinking about buying this real estate. Oh, I'm doing this flip. When was the last time you heard Bezos say, oh my God, dude, have you seen this deal, dude? We're all going into this deal. No, every word that comes out of those guys' mouth is about the future of the, of the world and the product that they're building to, 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 to solve a future problem. Wow. And that's who I want to be, dude. I don't want to be Warren Buffett. I don't want to be Dave Ramsey. I don't want to be Rob Kiyosaki. That's just not yeah. who I am. Dude, I'm feeling this right now, Sean. I was like, man, eight of us went on this deal. <laughs> Stony at lunch. Eight of us went on this deal. We're going to make... He was you talking know, about me. We're going to make We're gonna make $2 million. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're each going to get $234,000. Oh. We're going to be able to go and buy steaks and go on vacations <laughs> and buy Lambo Urises. It's like, dude, that's not interesting to me. It's just not. Like, to me, money is a complete game. If I yeah. lose this watch today, I lose it. If I crash my car, I crash my car. If my bank account gets drained, I drain my bank account. I care about what I have. Mm. And that's an investment that you can't take away. That's why I said, going back to the kid that has $1,834, invest in yourself. It's the number one real estate that you own that you will never sell. You might go on on that thing with eight other dudes. You guys are all piecing together your money, investing in that deal. <laughs> and what's happening, right? You're going to sell that deal at one point. You're going to make some money, but you're going to fuck off and you're going to go and spend it somewhere. And you might do the same thing over and over again. And I'm not knocking it. You're going to make money. You're going to be successful at that thing. But for me, uh, if I'm just selling short term and I'm doing things that I'm going to get rid of, like that's not fulfillment for me. Yeah. That's not happiness for me. I need to build something that like the day I die, people are like, I remember Zane for that. When Patrick Kenny dies, no one's going to be like, did you remember that deal in AZ? There's eight dudes all on one deal, hopping in on it, JVing it. Man, that was an unbelievable flip. Clip that. No one's going to be talking about that. <laughs> That's going on my Instagram, man. It's rough over here, all right? It's a rough pod for me. All right. So... <laughs> yeah, it's the roast. That's all right. It's all right. So, so he needs I, that though. I got a I got a question. I want, it, 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 next time I come, I want her to be like, dude, selling a house for fifteen mil, and get and guess who my partners are? Fucking no one. I want to hear that, dude. <laughs> so, so my next question is it's like going, eight dudes sharing a steak. Oh man, <laughs> he's rolling. Yeah, he's rolling, Junior. Eight dudes yeah. sharing a girl or something. He's a little <laughs> freaky. So, so my next question has to do with that one thousand eight hundred question, but. Really, no money. Um, obviously, I know you're biased. I'm also biased in the same industry. Um, there's plenty of people that listen to podcasts all day long. They read books all day long. They, you know them. They do all this shit all day long. They do it way more than us, by the way. Yeah. And they have zero success. I know you're going to say solar. Obviously. I was going to say, what industry would you jump into? But how would you jump into that industry? How would you attack that industry? Where would you go? to begin making money early, quick, fast. It uh, wouldn't just be solar, if I'm being honest. Like, yes, bias-wise, selfish-wise, I want you to be in the industry, and I think it's a great opportunity for a lot of people to go out there and be a part of something long-term and make a lot of money. But there's a million things you could do. If you're a freaking nerd and you love coding, like, jump into AI. Become the best at AI. Everyone is talking about AI. Right. Jump all into that. If you love cars... Figure out the future of cars. Electric cars are happening. Whether you like them or not, we're seeing every major corporation. We're seeing Audi, Mercedes, BMW, Lamborghini, Bugatti. Every single company is getting into the electrification of vehicles. Go and figure that out. Like, there's an, like in every industry, there's opportunity. And there is no shortage of opportunity. The only thing there's a shortage of is a lack of arrogance. People are so arrogant. You want to know the number one thing that I notice between some of the most successful people I meet and some of the people that think that they're successful is arrogance. People that think that they're successful, 
they're very, very like, oh, you know, I know my thing. I know everything. I understand everything. They're an expert on everything. Some of the wealthiest people I've ever met in my life, all they do is ask me questions. Tons of questions. Oh, that's really cool. How did you do that? Oh, that's very interesting. One of my buddies, Adam Weitzman, he's a billionaire. He's always around, tons of celebrities. You can look him up. Extremely well-known dude. Literally from Kim Kardashian, Ron DeSantis, Trump, every president that you've ever met, every celebrity you know. Like In some way, this guy is connected to them and he's friends with them and they all love them. One day he invited me for coffee and I was at his house. He has a really nice penthouse. He's like, he's a neighbor of mine. And we're sitting down we're talking, we're talking. And all he's doing is asking me about like my business. He's like, that's so cool, man. We'd love to figure out how to work together, partner. Dude, you're so smart at your age. Like, yeah. dude's a billionaire. And I talked to another guy. This guy's got a hundred grand. You know, he thinks he knows everything. He's mastered his, you know, his trading or his crypto or, you know, his real estate flips. And what does he say to me? Oh, well, this is how deals work. And Zane, you're wrong about this multifamily thing. You know, commercial is the way to go. It's like, what? Yeah. That's why when I meet people, like, you'll never catch me going around being like, you have to do this or you need to do this. It's like, the way I win is by observing people's actions, yeah. not by, you know, just following people. And I think a huge mistake that a lot of people make and the reason that they never kind of cross this threshold of success or truly gain financial freedom or success is they think that it's not possible and they think that they're, that they're smart and they think that, you know, there's no way that it could be that easy. Yeah. So I, I've actually made several videos about what I believe. It's funny you said that. There's, I, I think there's two words that can depict the reason why people don't continue to hit the next level. It's ignorance and arrogance. I, I always have used those two words. So I'm going to flip it back on you now. There, there, yes, there's plenty of people in this audience that are probably watching this going, man, I don't have anything. I'm getting inspired. I'm but then there's probably a guy that makes 300 a year. He's got 85000 in the bank. He thinks he's hot shit. And he's been making 300 a year for seven years straight. And he can't get to the next level. So let's talk about that guy now. He's, he's in the, he's in the, he's in, a, he's, in a, he's in his own head. Where did, where do you go with that? What do you do with that? How do you, how do you approach getting to the next level, making a million bucks from 300,000? What do you do? I mean, dude, I don't even talk to that guy. I don't even have a conversation with those people. That's not growth. Yeah. You want to know what's more inspiring to me? You made five grand, then you made 30, then you made 100, then you made 150. That dude I'll have a conversation with. You made 300 for the last 10 years and you're obsessed with it and you think that you're hot shit. I don't even want to have a conversation. Listen, like sometimes I'll be in a room and I don't care about how much money people make. That's not the reason that I talk to them. I care about how you conduct yourself. If someone walks up to me and they're bragging and boasting about what they do, like I, it's an instant turnoff for me. I want to see the people, again, I observe. Yeah. I want to see the people that I observe. I'm like, oh, wow, this dude puts in the work. This guy's a hard worker. This guy gets it done. Those are the people that I like to surround myself with. So to be honest with you, I don't even have a conversation with that guy. But if I were to have a conversation, I'd just be like, you, you, you ought to be embarrassed. It's not because you're making 300K, but you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, and you're not progressing and you're not growing. Imagine going to the gym every day for 10 years, curling 40-pound dumbbells, and never being able to accomplish curling 41 pounds. Yeah. Wow. It feels like suicide. It feels like death. It's, you might as well be in a jail cell because mm -hmm. you do the same thing every single day. It's a prison without bars. I think that's what kills people more than anything. It's not about how much they make. Yeah. It's about what's their progress and their growth. Are they growing? You hear it all the time, right? If you're not growing, you're dying. Love it. So I got two more questions. Number one is, what does the day-to-day -day look like? I will not like? invest in that deal with you. Huh? I'm not going to be number nine. <laughs> Jeez, it's the roast. <laughs> okay. I need another high noon at this point. <laughs> so, so I got two more questions. Number one is, what does a day-to-day -day look like? For Zane Jan. That's my first question. I'm curious, what, what does it look like for you? On, on, not on a travel, but like you're in yeah. Miami, you're at home, or I think you work from home. What does it look like? Yeah, I wake and, and, up. And, and, and Sean laughed at that question, so be honest. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I wake up at 5 a.m. I cold shower. I write down my goals. No, I do none of that bullshit. Um, and, and listen, I'm not, I'm not bringing it down. Routine is extremely important. Discipline is important. You got to do what works for you. But every person is different. I hate when people go on there like, you have to wake up at 5 a.m. What if I work till 3 a.m.? You know, like at the end of the day, for me, it's not about what's your routine or, you know, what hours do you wake up and what hours do you go to sleep? It's the hours that you are awake, what results and progress are you actually getting done? So for me, it's very simple. The earliest I probably wake up, uh, unless it's obviously traveling or early flight or something, is probably like 6.30. The latest I probably wake up is 7.30 maybe 7.45. I'm usually always, for years and years and years, I've been in that same routine. Um, I wake up, I try to hit the gym if I can, right? If I have time, if I, if I don't have a meeting directly after or something like that, try to get some activity in and actually get moving. Usually 9 a.m. to 9.30 is my time and my focus on getting shit done where no one's going to distract me. I don't look at my phone. Don't look at my emails. I just work on the things that I need to make progress on because a lot of the business that I do um, starts really kicking off at 11 or 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because a lot of people are on Pacific Time. So we're, so we're three hours uh, 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 behind, yep. right? Or, or ahead. So for me, uh, a big part of it is just as soon as I wake up, getting activity in, getting my shit done, and then diving into meetings. And usually, it depends on the day, but usually meetings are back-to-back. -back. Earliest time a meeting ends usually, like back-to-back -back meetings is like 7 p.m. Sometimes they can go until 10, 11, sometimes midnight, et cetera. And then I go back into my get shit done mode, usually until 1 or 2 a.m. It's running analysis, um, it's new ideas, it's improvement of our current products, different things I'm working on, analyzing what my day was like and what I want to do tomorrow. And almost every single day, it's that thing. Um, and I'd say the biggest part of it is every month I measure myself. So I look at, okay, as a company, what are our KPIs? Personally, what are my KPIs? Whether it's financial, personal, health, like whatever it is. And every month I strive for a goal and a target. And if I'm behind on that target, I'm going to put in overtime to make sure I get that done. And I just, I have done that same formula and system for years and years and years that it's always worked for me. And what drove you to start measuring and tracking? Was it because you got so far ahead or did you do that from the start you were measuring a track because i need that i need a scoreboard i always tell people that don't like to track imagine watching the super bowl imagine watching the national championship and having no scoreboard wow oh <laughs> that was a mic drop um like that's yeah. what people do in their life yeah they fucking work every day and they have no scoreboard Sort of like imagine watching a football game and it's like yeah I, no one's counting score we, we don't know who's we winning. just watch we're just watching people hit each other it's what you're fucking doing in life wow. if you're not measuring yourself. Wow. Well, this has been incredible, first of all. Um, my last question is, we need a ninth, and I'm just kidding. My last question is, um, the, the demographic of this channel is 18 to 30-year-old males, 85% yep. of males. What would your piece of advice, if you give one piece of advice for them, be if they're just getting going, um, they don't think that traditional sit behind a desk nine to five routers for them. They want to make something bigger for themselves. What would you say for them to do? Burn the bridges, leave everything behind, leave every, you know, attachment that you have, everything that's emotional for you, put it all to the side, remove all emotion, invest everything you have into your future and go all in and don't say sorry to anybody. Wow. Well, that wraps up the roast of Patrick Henney. Love it. Special guest Zane Jan. If you guys could, um, first of all, find him on in the description on social media. You have a YouTube? I do. It's not active yet, but it will be active in the next coming months. We'll put his YouTube, Instagram, and uh, of course, follow him for that. Click the like button for more videos just like this. Of course, comment with your questions, your comments down below. Of course, subscribe. I think hopefully by the time you're watching this, we have 20,000 subscribers. So thank you guys so much for that. And we will see you on the next video.